Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer for Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining the latest in the monthly webinar series, Data Architecture Strategies with Donna Burbank. Today, Donna will discuss what does it mean to be a data-driven organization. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we'll be collecting them by the Q&A panel. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just to note, the chat defaults to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely change that to network with everyone. To open the chat and the Q&A panels, you'll find those icons in the bottom middle of your screen to enable those features. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides and recording of the session and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. And now let me introduce to you the speaker of the monthly series, Donna Burbank. Donna is a recognized industry expert in information management with over 20 years of experience helping organizations enrich their business opportunities through data and information. She currently is the managing director of Global Data Strategy G Limited, where she assists organizations around the globe in driving value from their data. And with that, let me give the floor to Donna to begin her presentation. Hello and welcome. Hello. Thank you, Shannon. Thanks everyone who joined. Always nice to see some familiar names on the on the uh, participation. So yeah, if this is your first time with us, uh, this is a series. All of the previous um, sessions are recorded and kept on both the Dataversity site as well as the Global Data Strategy site, um, so you can go back if you've missed any of these. The the one in May uh, this month and then next month, are, they're not exactly a series, but they do kind of tie together. Last month, we talked about the role of the Chief Data Officer, our CDO, or now CDAO, I guess, um, in business transformation. And then that kind of drives to our topic today, which is what does it mean to be a data-driven organization? We'll talk a little bit about the roles in a data-driven organization today, uh, but next month we'll do a deep dive. That's often a common question I get from our clients or from folks that are kind of building out a data team, you know, who's on it, what, what's that role between the business and tech and all of that. So that's a, a weighty topic in and of itself, but we will touch on that a bit today as well. Um, so moving on ahead, uh, what are we talking about today? So you hear a lot about the data-driven organization. Um, you know, it's in business periodicals, it's it's in, you know, technical conferences, but what does that really mean? And, and what I find interesting, so on a good day, I really love what I do for a living because I get to go to all different sorts of companies and help them with their data. But in doing that, if, if you're in data, you realize that data is the business, right? So to understand and help uh, any organization with their data, you really have to understand what makes that company tick. Um, and that's the beauty of data. It's a bit of a business thing. Uh, also the challenge as well, the beauty and the challenge is it's a bit of a business thing, but it's also at its core very technical as well. So, you know, what, what does that mean uh, to be a, a, a data driven organization? What roles make sense? And then, you know, this is a data architecture strategies uh, webinar. So we will kind of bring that um, back to uh, uh, this quote, modern data architecture and what that means. There's a lot of options nowadays. Um, it can be overwhelming and kind of confusing as to what we do to even use data warehouses anymore. Is it data, data lake houses? What do we do with streaming data and, 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 right? Um, and then what, what makes sense? Do we use AI uh, for, our, for our industry? Does it make sense? Where does it, where doesn't it, right? Uh, so we'll talk about all of that or touch on that uh, today. So um, as you know, if you've joined our webinars in, in the past, um, Dataversity and uh, Global Data Strategy partner every year on a survey for data management. And one of the key questions we always start is kind of the, so what? Why are you doing this? What are your business drivers for doing data management or just data in general, right? The number one, no surprise, we've been doing this survey, I think six years now, um, and year over year, Reporting and analytics is absolutely the number one response. Probably not a surprise. That's sort of what a lot of folks think of when they think of data um, is it's my reports, right? Or my dashboard or my AI or my analytics. So that's not you know too surprising. I also want to touch on though, this idea of saving costs, increasing efficiency. And we'll talk about this through throughout the webinar. This whole idea of, of data is literally driving the business. It is operational as well. You know, your, your product catalogs, your pricing, your students, if you're a university, your, your client, you know, all of that really is, is data and that runs your business. So, um, you know, this, this next one, which is, you know, supporting digital transformation, um, you know, is, is that almost like the, the dot-com 
where I don't know if it's a boom, but it just becomes business as usual, you know, selling things online, doing government services online, et cetera, et cetera. So um, some of the other, I won't read through each one and bore you to death, but, you know, a lot of these others are, you know, customer satisfaction, revenue growth, product quality. And the other one that I'll touch on the second from the bottom, I like to see, because I don't think we focus this enough, um, is this idea of improving outcomes. It could be health ed outcomes. It could be societal benefit, you know, education you know, this whole idea of data for good is, is a, you know, a whole trend uh, loving it because that's, you know, keeps our world a happy place. Um, and it, it, maybe because it's easy, we often use kind of the examples of products and customers and widgets and sales and that kind of thing. And that absolutely is data driven. And we will talk about that, um, but it's not the only thing now, which sort of leads me into the next slides. I love to see this. It's a bit of an eye chart, you know, <laughs> really meant to read every single one. Um, but what I love about this, um, Shannon mentioned in the intro, I've been I've been doing data, gosh, almost 30 years now, or definitely over 25. Um, and when I started and when a lot of folks started, the only folks really doing data were sort of the big ones, you know, uh, finance, government, uh, you know, so, some retail banking, um, that, that kind of thing. Um, now everyone's doing it. And so what I love is you'll still see some of those top one, you know, consulting, because a lot of us consultants kind of live on data diversity, but, um, you know, education is a huge one. Uh, you'll see healthcare. If you go down to the bottom, I find that super fun, you know, gaming, entertainment, electronics, chemicals, you know, alternate dispute resolutions, right? It, Basically, everyone's doing it, right? So all the cool kids who are, are successful are doing data now. But I think um, I think this puts a lot of things in perspective. We're not covering the survey in this uh, in this webinar. We actually will be doing it next month at Data Architecture Online uh, and covering that more depth. You know, sometimes we'll see you know the maturity of data governance or data driven is low, and, and one could get frustrated by that. I think that in a lot of ways, that's a good thing because it means a lot of new entrants are in the business. If we just focused on something like finance or, you know, if you're in finance, you could say, really, we're we're, we're advanced, but <laughs> you are often, I'm not in your company, so I can't uh, say you specifically, but, you know, some of the folks that by definition who have been doing this for a long time are going to be more mature. So often when I see survey results saying, you know, a lot of folks are just entering data governance or data management or being data driven or data analytics. I think it's because of that kind of long tail on this chart, which I find super exciting. And as I kind of mentioned in the beginning is, is why I love my job, because you just go to get to see the, the most fun different kinds of companies. I don't give an example of every one. I could, uh, if you let me, I'd probably talk all day. But, you know, we've worked with anything from a, a museum in the Midwest to, to um, you, you know, a social media company to, you know, and it's just really interesting to see how all of these different topics companies are using data at their core and, and can. So we'll kind of go through some of these examples um, just to kind of see the diversity um, of, of usage of data, but you'll also see some common themes. So um, on that note of common themes, when one looks to get value uh, from data, and I think I even showed this on the, on the last webinar as well, because uh, I think it sets the stage. There's kind of four buckets. There's others, and I'd be open to see, you know, if folks are doing things completely out, out of these realms. Um, but decreasing costs is a big one. Um, and I wish more people realized this, right? That good data management, good data governance makes things more efficient. So yes, it may cost thing cost a little bit more to set things up, as would anything. Uh, but over time, not only are you going to save time from not doing inefficient data management, cleaning up data or, or you know, make but that type of thing. Um, but also you may be making poor decisions based on your data or um, we'll use some examples later on kind of supply chain and manufacturing and, and business processes are much more efficient with good data driving them, right? So um, actual cost avoidance, not just you know, better data management, but actually running the business becomes more efficient. I also think if if you are tasked with doing kind of an ROI or, or return on an investment analysis, kind of the easiest one is to show those decreasing costs because you will find inefficiencies, either people spending time and how much salary and time did they spend. Um, one of the one of the bottom, you know, people still do physically mail things. Uh, we've seen, you know, you have bad addresses and you're sending, you know, X amount of, of, old letters to to folks that don't exist anymore or in the wrong address and get returned. You know, so things like that you can actually quantify. I think more exciting when you're thinking about a data driven organization is this idea of increasing revenue, right? I have uh, three customers right now who came to us and saying we're trying to optimize our price. That first bullet, 
and the data isn't good enough to do that, or we're trying to optimize our uh, supply chain or our operations or whatever optimization comes in, I often think data because you need the, if I'm trying to optimize my price, what were the previous prices? What were the other factors that were involved at that time at a given price? The inputs, the outputs, the market conditions. I mean, anyone, and these aren't quote data titles, right? They may be the, the pricing lead or they may be in finance or they may be in operations. They're doing data. And we'll talk about this at the end. I think those of us who have data in our title per se, often can be, a, I'll just say it, I'm one and we're, we're in family here, <laughs> kind of snobbish or, or or elitist or whatever. It's like, oh, the business won't understand. Uh, I, I bet you they're probably doing this, some heavy duty lifting in a lot of the departments. Um, marketing does analytics, right? So, and they are using data to make decisions to drive the organization. So um, I wouldn't be surprised that folks are a little weightier in the analytics than you may realize. So um, that's the second bullet, marketing campaigns. Um, Actually, Shannon and I were talking before this uh, webinar on on that very topic. How how do you quantify marketing? What's what are the right metrics to use? That sort of thing. Um, so much of data driven on that third bullet is so embedded in our life we don't even think about it. Who hasn't bought on Amazon.com and and things like you know uh, uh, customers who bought this also bought this, right? Uh, Amazon is a product company, but it's almost by definition a data company. They, the way they use data not only for you know recommendations engine, sales, product master data, supply chain, all of that is top notch, right? Um, but that bottom um, bullet, better grant writing, I do want to stress throughout this, it isn't just, again, retail companies selling widgets. We, we're working with several nonprofits as well. And if you want to get a grant, you need to show how what, well you're doing. We had one um, nonprofit that actually won an award on their use of data management and they actually got some good grants because wouldn't you want to give your grant money to someone who runs their company effectively? And part of that is data. And they can also show their effectiveness through data, right? So it's a, a virtuous cycle, right? Reducing risk. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. I, I, I don't want to stress that because to me, that feels more stick than carrot um, and maybe not data driven. Maybe it's data reactive, or you could you can argue with me there in the chat. But I mean, I, I think some of this is, you know, we don't want to get in, in trouble. So GDPR um, you, you, right, we want to market to customers. We don't want to break any laws in doing so, or, or we want to protect people's privacy in doing so. We want to deliver better health care. We want to make sure we're compliant with HIPAA, but I don't think HIPAA drives health care, if that makes sense. And, and again, you can argue with me, but I, I think um, I'm going to just touch that lightly. So I'll stop talking about it because I said I would touch it lightly. So, but protecting reputation, again, that's not necessarily um, a pure dollars and cents, uh, a little harder to do a, like a, you know, numbers driven ROI on that, but we just know, <laughs> there you go, gut feel. We'll talk more about that. Um, that makes sense. Our, well, some of this can be quantified customer satisfaction, right? How many people, that when you buy, it's almost an epidemic, right? You buy something, would you recommend this this product to your um, friend? Well, that's because your marketing is getting a, a number, right? My, my net promoter score. Um, so you can, you know, kind of quantify some of that. Um, things like trust, right? Can you, you can definitely get some of this through social media, voice of customer, uh, loyalty. Also, you don't want the other thing on the other side, right? That, you know, you had a breach or, or, or heaven forbid, some litigation or um, that sort of thing. So I think all of this can be quantified through data to show the values of these, but also data supports um, both the, the carrot and stick on, on these areas. So um, let's go through some examples and, and maybe this is helpful, maybe this is obvious, but I think uh, kind of showing the breadth of the different industries that can be data driven. So having said we overdo retail and overdo product, what am I going to start with product, right? But I do think that's something that we can all relate to. We all buy products, um, whether we love it or not. I do not love to buy stuff, but we all have to, right? So, um, and then I wanted to break it down in each of these into some of the different areas of data driven. So Again, data-driven, often we think of dashboards, literally that pun, I had a car in the first slide, a dashboard is what you have in a car when you're driving a car to see how fast you're going. What's my performance of my car while I'm driving? So that analogy holds true. I'm trying to see where I'm going, and so you use a dashboard. But data is also the engine. So things like master data management is actually an operational benefit as well. If I'm selling product, 
Um, I probably want to have some dashboards. How well am I doing? What is my customer spend by region? Who are my top spend customers? What are my profit? What's my profitability over time? What are the top, especially digitally enabled products? What are the top used product features? And, and do you know if you're if you're using an online web based software? For good or bad, they're 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 kind of seeing what you use. So features never used by anybody, maybe we'll deprecate that. Feature super pop popular or people are struggling with it. We'll we'll kind of focus on that one more. Um, so that's kind of your pure dashboarding. But again, I'm selling product online. I'm well, it's not <laughs> Amazon is not our customer, but just you know, as an example, Amazon is driven by a product master data, their product catalog. When you click on that website and are trying to buy shoes or, you know, car parts or whatever you buy on Amazon, um, that's driven by a product catalog, your product hierarchy, your product master, as well as you, you are the customer master, the suppliers, all of the suppliers that sell online, the locations uh, from the suppliers, from the customers, et cetera. So all of those building blocks, if they're not good, um, will hamper the effectiveness that you're trying to monitor with your BI dashboard. And maybe that's obvious. I think it's not obvious enough though, because um, I, I see too many people only focusing on the dashboards and forgetting well, I can actually literally drive the business and, and actually improve my operations by, I can save money by, you know, consolidating my suppliers or the number of major um, uh, conglomerates across the globe that we've worked with that have actually seen things like uh, cost savings that they're all buying from all the divisions are buying from the same supplier. But until we're actually able to get something like supplier master, we weren't able to get that economies of six scale and, and negotiate better pricing because we're actually buying a thousand widgets, not just five at a time. Right. Um, so it can actually have operational efficiency, customer satisfaction that you saw on that first list. You need good customer master who, who will be satisfying. Right. Uh, so they all are interchanged. It can also have a negative effect. We worked with one super um, uh, popular retail good that they had customers that almost all of these other things, they had great uh, product reputation, they had managed risk, uh, they were actually growing revenue, but their product master data was so problematic when they were trying to sell on Amazon, they got so many fines for their master data not meeting standards, they were actually losing money in some regions because, because of just poorly formatted product master data, right? So you need to have those core components or it's really hard to grow and scale. A lot of customers come to us in the retail space, and we'll talk more about this, this idea of gut feel. I had one, I had a very blunt customer to come to me and, and I was trying to explain how they needed better product catalog, product hire. They were growing revenue massively multi-billion dollar company that's literally started in someone's basement and one of the founders actually was there i'll never forget this meeting and and i was trying to say you know it's going to be hard to scale without something like a good product master data and he looked at me said are you a billionaire did you start a company in your basement and now grew it to a billion and you're telling me how to run my company and and uh you know, respectfully i said you've done a great job i'm not a billionaire <laughs> But um, I do know working with other companies, you're going to have trouble scaling to the next phase. What got you here isn't going to get you there. And we saw a lot of companies that you can get by, you can do really, really well with poor data to a point, and then your success is almost going to slow you down, right? You're going to have so many products, so many customers, so many suppliers. Awesome. <laughs> Good rate problem to have, right? If, if, if you're not a successful company, you're not going to have a lot of products, customers, and suppliers, but it will weight you down that, that um, with the, the volume of that. So a lot of companies looking to scale, especially in retail, need to look at that. Um, so I'm kind of rambling a bit today. I apologize. But that, that middle one, I, I I didn't skip. I'll go back to it. Advanced analytics, right? So your dashboards, if this is new to you, it's kind of your typical, you know, show me what I always think it's the buys, right? Show me customers by region, profitability by time, you know, et cetera, et cetera, kind of your trending. But advanced analytics, you know, market basket analytics might be one. What do people purchase together? You know, when people go into, we're working with one kind of um, uh, consumer, you know, Oh gosh, you know, you go after work and you buy a soda. Do you buy candy bars with soda or do you buy cigarettes with soda? And what are kind of the patterns? And, and and if people buy cigarettes with soda, do you put cigarettes next to the soda or, or whatever, right? Um, suggestions engines, we already talked about that with um Amazon, right? Uh footfall analytics, especially in retail space. How do people um there's been some great success stories of of retail organ? I think REI did a good thing with this as well. You know, where are people walking around the store and how do they buy things and how do you, you know, store layout is super important in any retail organization or who 
um, you know, anonymization is key <laughs> where, where uh, for some of this, but you know, who isn't walking into the store? Um, what are the patterns of traffic that go by and we're not capturing that? Or, or where do we perhaps build a new retail location based on footfall analytics? Uh, Real-time streaming, can someone be walking by with their cell phone and get an ad? And the list goes on, right? That is data-driven. And, and retail is so intertwined with data at this point. That's why I picked it first. So yes, it's overused. Um, but absolutely right before um, enhancement, if you are in retail and you're doing some of these and not others, the world's really your oyster, obviously, with privacy, security, GDPR, CCPR, et cetera. Um, but um, there's some really great things you can be doing that, that actually do benefit the customer. I think we're so used to some of these. Some of them are annoying. <laughs> some of them are really helpful, um, you know, uh, what other people have bought, what their suggestions are and things like that. Okay, moving on. Um, transportation. I'm, I'm trying to pick ones that now that I've done the, the ubiquitous uh, retail, maybe trying to pick some out of the box ones. Maybe there's some folks that are on these um, industries. Maybe you'll kind of get some ideas from those. I mean, that's what we as consultants, what I love is sometimes it's the weirdest uh, analogy that it's a totally different in industry, but some of the data patterns are the same and you can kind of get that cross pollination. So giving you a little bit of that here. Um, we've worked with several transportation companies in the past couple of years. Not sure what that means. Sometimes they come in, in packs. Um, but but again, probably not surprising. What are, what are our is transportation trying to quote Dashboard, a bit of a pun there, because they literally have dashboards. Um, you know, what what are some of their inputs? Drivers, drivers, tractors, trailers. Um, what are the costs of those? What's the efficiency of driving a route? You know, some of the stuff, as the more I got into it, super fascinating that you just don't think of. I'm trying to deliver product from point A to point B or, or combine routes for different customers. Gosh, that's an analytics you know, dream when you think about it, all of the different options you can optimize through location, um, value of, of load, risk per load, you know, linking customers, that kind of thing. Um, you know, who are my top customers, but not only just the customers, what are they hauling? Is it is it gasoline? Is it medicines? Is it, you know, fabrics, right? Um, and kind of understanding that. Um, and then advanced analytics as well. Trucking is if we just pick transportation aspect of trucking, uh, the trucking aspect of transportation, hard to get good truckers. So if some kids and they want to be truckers, the jobs for them. Right. Um, so how do I get that right? The people I have met ever in, in trucking love it. it. It's the right job for the right person. So how do you get that right person? Right. What are the type of folks we're going to hire that are going to love it and not go crazy? It wasn't for me. I sat in one of the trucks at one of our clients and it was sort of fun for about 10 minutes, but I don't think I, I'm too fidgety to drive a truck long term. Um, but again, how do we have those predictive analytics to determine employee made ah, employee turnover, predictive maintenance? Again, what are your assets? It's your drivers. It's your tractors, your trailers, let's keep them running. When they're not running, we're not making money, right? So how do we get ahead of that through predictive maintenance? You know, dashboards can tell you when you broke down, advanced analytics can, can hopefully predict and, and do predictive maintenance so you can get ahead of things. Um, Real-time streaming, right? Uh, can I be tracking the drivers? Are they driving safely? Who's speeding? Um, where is my driver? Heaven forbid there's an accident or they need to, to move to a different route. You know, can we actually track real time? And we're, we're so used to that. We just think of your Uber app, right? Um, but, but think of something like Uber on steroids when you're doing transportation at massive scale, right? Um, we've also worked slightly related with several um, public transportation, you know, your trains, your buses, and, and they do something similar. You know, how, how do I, you know, literally track the location of the train the, the bus and, and they're doing some uber like <laughs> features not maybe not with the budgets of uber if it's public but um some really interesting things you know you get out of work instead of taking an uber hey there's a, a train coming in five minutes do you want to take that instead it's five bucks instead of you know 30 or, or whatever right so a lot of opportunities that what's interesting is a lot of these bigger players have open source you know some of the, the amazons and the um you know, these big players have open sourced a lot of the analytic models and a lot of the, the things that they use that, you know, some of these other industries are now able to uh, leverage, which is nice. So what might be master data management for for uh, transportation? You know, that last bullet I kind of already covered, but your vehicles, your drivers, your routes, how do we optimize routes? There's some set routes, um, you know, similar with public transportation, there's your bus route. How do we need more? How do we optimize them? Um, so anyway, kind of a different one you might not have thought of, but it's kind of the engine. Huh. 
pun there, um, behind um, retail. So kind of related. Um, social service is another one we've done a lot with. And, and I like this again, because it's not selling widgets, it's helping people. Um, and we've done several flavors of this across different in, you know, social services, whether it's public, private, uh, or nonprofit. Um, and some of the, the themes across all are, one is just how many individuals are we serving? And, and I get, you know, in, in the whole you know, retail widget, it's you know, who are our customers and how do we count those? Maybe, maybe a little easier because they're buying something. But when you think of the complexity of human beings and the complexity of services, um, you know, maybe I'm... Maybe I'm in a Head Start program with a child, but the parents are also taking classes, right? Or maybe there's a, a substance abuse in a homeless shelter, but is the family impacted, right? So it isn't always just the person you serve. Um, and some of those individuals are hard to track. Think of a homeless population. You can't just do address verification <laughs> services uh, to do that because there's no traditional address, right? So I kind of... Um, you know, hum humbling some of these um, use cases, but from a data management perspective, really interesting that it isn't just your standard. Yeah, John Smith lives at 101 Main Street and you validate that with US Postal Service is a lot more complicated. Um, really getting into the demographics of our clients. Some of the social services have done some really interesting dashboarding of, you know, what are the um, demographics of our clients and is our staff matching that? Um, one of our clients had a high you know, Middle Eastern population and didn't have enough Arabic speakers, and but they didn't realize that until they started to actually look at those demographic dashboards. So dashboards for social services, um, you know, what's the cost per service? Are we maximizing even in nonprofit and in, in trying to help people? Uh, one of my clients had a great phrase, you can't do the mission without the margin, right? So we do have to keep you know, track of costs and also money coming in top donors by year. Are we getting the right grants coming in? Um, and then advanced analytics for, for me, for social services, I find fascinating. You know, what, what is the impact of our services over time? What, what, what thing can we do for a human being? Um, I know we work with some uh, homeless um, shelters where, where we're doing some really interesting analysis of all the things you can do for folks in the homeless community or unhoused community. What, what's, what's going to have the biggest impact? Um, or uh, we've done some, you know, child services, someone at four years old, what, what's the biggest impact you can do? So when they're 25, um, they really have, um, you know, good outcomes. So, um, and also just forecasting for future service, you know, how have services trended other differences across seasons, across demographics, et cetera, et cetera. You know, a lot of the stuff that we kind of expect in, in, in retail and in, in business can also be used for social services. And then their master data is, you know, individuals, families, uh, what is a family has been some really interesting like kind of philosophical it isn't always just biological mom and dad it could be an extended community what is a service is it a paid service is it an extended service you know tracking our staff making sure it aligns with clients so anyway i'm not sure how many folks on this call are in social services but i, I found that just you know some of the times thinking of these things slightly different than we always talk about um can be kind of interesting um, higher ed, again, this is another one that I don't know if it's increased more. Or we're just seeing more of it, but love it. Um, so much opportunity here. Uh, so similar to social services, you know, how many students are we serving? Are we serving them effectively? What are our costs uh, per fa facility? I, and I guess it's obvious. I didn't realize how much brain power goes into kind of planning a campus and what facilities are used and used by whom, et cetera, who's enrolling by what discipline. How do we how do we maximize that and extend across engineering versus, you know, English and, and all of that? Um I found it fascinating kind of that I, I mean I went to college, but I didn't know how one worked until until I looked at the data and I found it just really, really interesting. Um and similar advanced analytics, right? Of what factors influence academic success. We we worked with one university um, you know, their mantra or their tagline, whatever it was, it's not whom we exclude, it's whom we include. And it was less about trying to be really elite, but getting more people to come and stay and succeed, right? So what are those predictive factors, both once they're in the door in the university or even earlier? What, what's going to affect them even in high school or, or grade school that's going to get them into college and stay? Um, real time streaming could be interesting there. Could it be, they had some, some were interesting. Some surprised me. You're walking by the library, you get a cell phone alert, time to study. Not sure that would work. Um, they had an interesting one though, uh, that was very data driven and I, I never would have thought of it myself, but, um, they, they had a, an issue with, um, high school students that may have accepted in when you graduate in whenever you accept us, but what is it? May, June, whatever. Right. And they've said, yes. 
but then between June and September, didn't show up. Um, tried reaching out, trying to do all of this, and they actually gave cell phone alerts, and that worked amazingly. And what what had sort of happened is a lot of these folks that maybe they were first generation, they didn't know what to do, they didn't want to talk to someone and say they didn't know what to do. But when it was a cell phone saying, "Hey, you need to sign up for your dorm. Hey, you need to do this," the the success rate was was um, increased. So that's just that's data driven. They looked at the data, they saw that that worked. A uh, football analytics, where are folks traveling across campus? You know, who's at the who's the football game? Uh, definitely some ethics in there. I know we work with one university. What is ethical. Can you track a student across, you know, they used to always go to the football game with their friends and, and now they're not. Should we, should we intervene or is that just creepy and you shouldn't, or is that illegal with FERPA, right? So again, with all of the data driven and a lot of opportunity, um, is it right or is it helpful? And then master data, students, course, locations, faculty, course, you know, curricula, super fascinating there. Um, Manufacturing, another one, this is a good one. So not only in terms of BI and dashboarding, you know, top suppliers by who's going to be, give us the best product to, with the few, fewest defects. Um, what's the production line productivity rate? Um, and then what's the top output plan for employee? And, and th there was one we worked with a manufacturing company in Latin America. Um, and we've been talking a lot in the industry about culture and how culture can affect data and being data driven. And, and this particular culture, again, wouldn't maybe have worked in a different industry or a different region, but there were different production lines. And when one, this was a car manufacturer, actually like the picture, and whoever finished that production line first, their song played. It was like mariachi music that would blare and they all had their song. And it was kind of like good, maybe good nature, maybe stressful, <laughs> depending don't know that part, um, but because I know one group, I would hear their song over and over. I'm like, wow, that, you know, the Ford line is doing really, really well. Um, and so we took that and said, well, let's do that with data quality. Have they have they entered the data for their route? And they actually had dashboards at the end of the production line and had their they got the music to play if the data for their production was top notch and, and complete and all of that. So we, we took that. And again, I don't know if that would work with an investment bank in New York, but in this particular environment, they were super data driven, just not for data, if that made sense. So we actually made the the dashboards front and center, right? Um, so advanced analytics was just in their DNA, predictive maintenance, uh, next next best action for operational efficiency. You, you're you're doing a particular action. What's going to make the, what's the next piece on the car I should put in that's going to get the whole thing done for it? And it isn't always the same thing every time. So kind of using analytics to show that. Um, Real-time streaming, production monitoring, and again on that cross-functional, uh, you know, overlap. Um, I was looking through some of the notes of one of the customers, and the guy was like, "I can I can FaceTime with my grandmother, um, but I can't see what my my plant lines are doing, right? So how can we, you know, take stuff we're used to in the commercial realm, uh, the consumer realm, and, and make it commercial, right? And then what are master data management? If anyone is in production, uh, manufacturing, or or retail, right? This idea of a part versus a component versus a, pr you know, product and how they all fit together, uh, your suppliers, your customers, et cetera. So anyway, I think that's probably enough. I hopefully I didn't bore folks and where it was um, industries that weren't yours, or maybe you kind of got some ideas in other industries that you hadn't thought of, but all of these are data-driven. All of these are very different and all of them have both, you know, kind of that dashboarding aspect, the real-time aspect, the advanced analytics aspect, et cetera, et cetera. So did want to talk about this when we talk about deep data driven, we talk about customers, right? And I know this picture is kind of disgusting, but it is kind of show the brain and the gut feel. Literally, there's a gut, sorry. Um, but I know you've probably heard this and it's been frustrating to me. You do a great dashboard, you go to sales and say, we're going to show you the top spending customers. And they say, you know, I just know my customer. You can't tell. I don't need a dashboard for that. I've been doing this for 20 years. Don't tell me how to run my business, right? I don't know how many folks have heard that. Be interested to see in the chat. Um, but is that always bad? Like, I think as data people, we just cringe at that. I'm going to go by gut feel. But I think we, it has to be both. And you've heard me say that a lot in my presentations, because sometimes we will do a dashboard and the business will say, I, I don't trust that data or that data doesn't feel right. Or perhaps it's because that's not the calculation or definition I use. So this this picture that I didn't develop, I found um, and purchased, <laughs> but um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a cycle, right? So you should be data driven with the facts. Sometimes the facts don't feel right and you might be right, right? So I think as long as you can validate through governance and through lineage and through good data definitions in the glossary, you can start to trust that data and you shouldn't just knee jerk say, I'm not gonna look at the data. 
but I, I think using both heart and gut and head and all of that um, is a good idea. So curious how other people are kind of seeing that. But I, I do think we don't want to just downplay gut feel, but we don't want to run only on gut feel. And you don't want to only go by the numbers and, and not kind of listen to common sense, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, I, this is back to the survey um, that we do. And one of the questions we often say is, does your organization treat data as a corporate asset? And I, I think when we ask the questions, are you looking data to, to make business decisions or organizational decisions? Generally, people were, but not everyone felt that they were treating data as a corporate asset. It's still more than half, right? 63%. Um, but why is it not? And I think that the definitions of, are you treating it like an asset? And if you've seen my presentations before, you, you've seen this um, framework is that you know, top down, you should have the business strategy aligning with the data strategy. You should have data governance and collaboration with the right people, process, and policy, et cetera. But there's a whole foundation that needs to be done back to that. I don't trust the data or my gut makes it, it doesn't feel right. You need to have those trusted data sets. And to get those trusted data sets, it's, it's multifaceted, right? You need master data for your core components. You need a good data warehouse for training over time. You need data quality management and architecture and security, et cetera, et cetera, right? Metadata uh, for the definitions. And so I think that explains this picture of, we know we need it, but we're not yet managing it. And and to be you know fair, I don't want to say we're new in an industry, but you know manufacturing and retail, they've evolved over time. Even finance, you know, there's generally you know accepted accounting principles and things, but that wasn't always the case, right? And there's a whole industry managing anything else we're, we're doing in the business. So there's a lot of work for our stuff too, which is data, right? So I think, um, you know, I, I suppose if you said anything else, do you trust your books? Do you trust your HR people management? Do you trust your product development? Not trying to cause controversy, but you, you probably wouldn't get a hundred percent there either, right? It's an evolution and, you know, you, you need to kind of manage it over time. So, um, what are the roles uh, that help manage this? It, it does take a village. And and I, I like to say a successful data-driven organization is business-led, tech-supported. And we often get the question of, okay, and, and it, you know, anything that has nuance is complicated for the human brain, um, but it's a business asset and it is driven by technology. So that is what makes, you know, does it report up to IT? Does it report through the business or through the business where? So I like to say, good data-driven org is, is business-led tech supported and they need to work together, right? So uh, this isn't a data governance webinar. Generally, there's roles called data owners, data stewards. We could you know discuss that for a whole webinar or more. Uh, but I just to summarize, those are people in the business with a day job and they're the decision makers and key and key consumers of data. They're the accountable, they're the responsibles for data, right? Um, we often just kind of say those of us in business and in data, sorry, say things like the business. And, and that's really generic to me. Here's a, a business guy right there. He's in the accounting, sales, supply chain, et cetera. The, those are very vastly different roles um, that we all kind of group together as a business. Um, you know, the driver back to that transportation company, that's quote, the business looks very different from the guy on the left, not wearing a suit, isn't quote business, but he is the business, right? Or education, you know, a, a teacher is quote, the business. And I have had teachers work with me building data models, having data-driven discussions, but their business is education, right? Or, you know, think of a the manufacturing, a plant or assembly operator, they're quote, the business, right? You know, it's not a guy in a suit, um, well, different kind of suit, <laughs> but again, it's, it's so broad or, you know, I didn't have this in the examples. We work with one restaurant chain and the chefs, the people who designed the menus, super data-driven. They were really nerding out on data models and data quality about their ingredients. It was basically product master, right? So I think we do a disservice when we just say the business and, but, but that also is the complexity of on you know, how do we support that? And that is where something like data governance or getting voices from all these different people to have them really drive that data. So uh, within the quote, the business, uh, there's at least two ways to support the business. I, I'll just, there's a lot of different ways you saw in those examples that one could be data driven. If we just kind of do the analytic and then the operational. So analytic is, let's just simplify it. It's your, it's your reporting, right? So something simple like, Show me product sales trends over time. Kind of your classic data warehouse or analytics. Um, often there's self-service reporting. As I talked about in the beginning, 
a lot of data folks are super data driven. They're just give me the data, give me data that's trusted and well understood. And I want to do my own slice and dicing and really kind of do some what if analysis and things like that. Um, and there's often a reporting analytics team. There's definitely specific skills that are needed. So often there's a BI reporting team, your 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 data scientists um, that can be actually be building some of these reports or, or doing some of these advanced analytics. Um, because I, I don't I, I do feel and interested in the chat what what folks have to say. Sometimes there feels like there's animosity, you know, where the business sort of says, uh, not when things run well. When it runs well, it's great, and there's great collaboration. But when it doesn't run well, it's things like the business saying, "I send all my my requirements to to IT or the tech folks, and the reports don't make sense, and then I, I don't know what they're doing, and it just doesn't feel right." And then the the tech folks are kind of, "Oh, the business doesn't know what they want, and they I, they they're never going to be happy." And it just feels wrong because all these people are into you know intelligent in their own own right. So do we have the right ecosystem to have those right? Um, questions to be asked right um so part of that is on the kind of these lower areas and you don't want i guess where i was headed sorry if i'm rambling today um too much overlap right so i think the business can do self-service reporting you don't and i've seen this and you don't want this to happen i am so frustrated with it i'm just going to get my own azure or aws or snowflake instance and just start building it myself um, and sometimes that works, but generally, I mean, there are skills, right? This whole theory of data management and star schemas and third normal form and, and knowing how to do that and, and optimize, there are skills, right? Um, and by the same token, I've heard tech folks say, oh, gosh, the business doesn't, I can't go back to the business. I'm just going to make a rule and go with it, you know? And I know the business well enough. I, I'll just make some business rules and go. I have to build this thing. I don't have time to talk to the business. Neither one of those is good. So it's kind of stay in your lane, but talk to the people in your other lane, because each one of these does have a valid role, which can make it challenging, but it makes it super interesting, uh, you know, uh, successful when this all works, right? So generally, there's some sort of layer on this kind of uh, second from the bottom that is a, a a formal business requirements collection either a data analyst and or a data architect metadata management might be kind of delving in what do you mean by the definition of total sales and doing that in a, a glossary or a bus matrix or something the data architect a kind of a business layer kind of designing the data and is this right is this what you kind of mean with to answer your questions um and then of course on the technical requirements and architecture your data engineers Kind of your technical data architect, your platform engineers, you know, how do I optimize my cloud ecosystem? Is it one? Is it two? All of that. Is it a data lake house or a data warehouse or all of those are valuable, but they all are asking different questions to support the ultimate answer that when the business looks at it, it's nice and clean and product sale trends over time makes sense. It's accurate. And we trust it. That's how you can make really use that as a dashboard to make those data driven decisions. So that's Super simplistic. The the webinar next month will go into much more detail about these roles and how they work, what the deliverables are and things like that. But just to kind of get that idea. And that's your analytics side. Sorry. Um, on the operational side, I'm kind of grouping operational as your master data, your operational data. This might be if the previous one was show me product sales trends over time. This might be just very tactical. Show me the correct product info on the website. Right. And this seems so just boring table stakes, the number of massive multinational organizations I've worked with where the product information on the website versus retail store, the dimensions or the price or the insert anything about your product here has been wrong and caused massive failure or cost overrun or embarrassment or all of those buckets of things that we, we mentioned earlier in the webinar, you know, re reputation, cost avoidance, that sort of thing have happened because it is it's complicated and it again it takes a village so that that's the kind of things i'm talking about here um so yes there, there's business users and these are the people actually um using the data right there's a pricing analyst that sets the price of a product someone is developing the product i know i'm using product but um the color of the product we only sell black and white products we don't sell green products so data quality is bad if there's green products in the data right the business has to set those rules and that is their day job so sometimes i'll talk to business folks who aren't quite yet bought into governance and they'll say shouldn't it fix the data I'm like great do you want it to set your product price <laughs> why would they do that well that's data right do you want it to set the valid colors for your product do you want it to manage your customers you know contact information that you talk to every day no with my customer exactly 
Um, and I guess because the business doesn't think about it as quote data. Sometimes it literally is their business. Would you want IT to you know set your invoice numbers, your purchase order numbers? No, that's my job exactly, right? So I think it's that accountability. However, there's a whole architecture beneath that. Uh, again, your data analyst, your data architect. I kind of added this idea of a business process workflow analyst because so much, especially with when I'm thinking master data or operational, understanding the touch points of where data is used across the business often solves or you know really optimizes a lot of these issues. Um, and then, of course, your technical requirements, your data engineer, your architect, your, your application owner, because I think at this point, you're really looking at the applications, your ERP, CRMs. Master data engineer, I mean, master data tools are their own thing, um, et cetera, et cetera. So um, this is an architecture uh, webinar, so promise to do some architecture. Uh, I'll go quickly uh, through this. We do want to leave some time for, for questions, but this is generic. It won't match everyone. It isn't everything <laughs> to just get ahead of some of the questions or chat. Um, but I think it's some of the key components to think of because it can be overwhelming with some of the all of those business cases. How do I build a ecosystem? And I do think we're evolving from you know data solutions really to data ecosystems, and they're melding with a lot of these cloud platforms. There's so many more options. You know this idea of a lake house where you can have kind of the data lake with some of your raw landing structured and unstructured data, structure that into a warehouse, structure that into an ODS, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So. I, we often build these kind of left to right, where left is your operational data, not only your structured things like your, you know, student registration systems, your product ordering management, but, you know, the sensor data from the trucks we mentioned about log files from, um, you know, tech support, social media, video streaming, all of that, right, can now be landed to do analytics. Um, and and that up to, through the semantic layer, or that's your user-friendly um access to reporting, your BI reporting, as well as advanced analytics, AI, machine learning, um, and then that master data. So to kind of link that to some of those use cases um, we talked about, what if we just go to that, you know, show me product sales trends over time? Um, kind of some of the key things highlighted here is going to be operational data that comes from an operational system, what, what my sales system, right, um, landed probably raw. And I'm kind of a fan of this data lake house architecture where it's the best of both worlds. You can land it raw in a lake-like structure, <laughs> um, structure it into a warehouse, provide a user-friendly semantic layer to the business, and then have that both self-service and standard reporting. Master data still plays a big role here, though. Um if anyone's familiar with this idea of a conformed dimension, right? Conformed just means it's the same one trusted over time. So your master data might be your customers, your products, your vendors. Those dimensions in that little star schema are probably customers, products, vendors, right? So let's make sure it's done well uh, and managed, and that can also be pushed back into your operational systems, which kind of goes to that next operational use case, which is master data, right? This might be, if this is, again, product sales over time, which is more of a data warehousing, your master data can be supporting the warehouse, but this can also be an operational use case. Literally right now at this time, make sure that the correct product information is on the website. So this is that idea of publish and subscribe that I have my list of products and my product hierarchy and the right price and the right dimensions and all of that. And I literally can sync that or subscribe back to all of the different source systems so the same product is correct everywhere. Think of this as, you know, customers, another great one. You change your address in one system, you want that same address to cascade across all of the others. So kind of a classic operational use case. Um, but th there's obviously more, right? We didn't talk um, a lot about the sensor data from a truck. You can do real time, you know, streaming to an app or streaming to some dashboards to show that uh, social media video uh, issues. You know, that's where some of your um, predictive analytics can be with some of the volume of, of some of these files. So it is an ecosystem. And I think, especially if you're looking to be more data driven in your organization, uh, you might look beyond, I, I don't know where you are, right? It's kind of a generic web, web uh, webinar, but are you focusing on one and not the other? Are you really focused on streaming data, but you don't have a good old fashioned data warehouse or the opposite? We have a good data warehouse. I haven't really thought of some of these other really more edge case or more modern um, patterns like, like real-time streaming. Or maybe I have 
warehouse, I haven't really thought of the, the master data feeding into that or master data really driving my operations. Or maybe I have great BI reporting. I haven't really thought of whole, this whole idea of AI and machine learning and some of these you know more modern use cases. So something to think of. So in summary, I know we covered a lot, but organizations of all types can be data-driven. I find that fun. I think that's an opportunity for anyone in the data management space. You can work for any kind of company now, right? Um, it can be both analytic and be operational. Gut feel is one of those both positive and negatives. Um, don't want to run a company only on gut feel, but you don't want to only run on the data and not kind of look at common sense. Um, to build this data-driven organization, it has to be business-led or tech or IT supported because it really needs the collaboration. It is complex, but at the end of the day, it should be led and, and driven by the business. So, um, Again, if you're interested in any of those roles, we're going to talk about that more next month. Um, we do this for a living. If you need help with any of this, both the roles, the governance, the architecture, come to us at Global Data Strategy. And I'm going to open it up to Shannon for Q&A. Over to you, Shannon. Anna, thank you so much for another great presentation. Always lovely to hear. In fact, I was taking notes for myself. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I absolutely love it. Um, so um, Donna, what is the, your definition of data-driven? How data-driven level can be measured within an organization? Um, yeah, I think I think that one came in early and maybe I, I answered it throughout, but a um, lot, lot of ways. I think there's at least two. One is, um, are decisions made based on data? And that's why I kind of mentioned that gut feel, um, because I think, and, and kind of, you know, is there a metric to track all of this? I guess that's a whole um, conversation in and of itself. But I know when we're trying to push a data-driven culture or data governance, our, one of our success stories was... Um, they used to be a very gut feel organization and exec was looking at report and they said, where did you get the numbers for this report and how do I make sure it's trusted and people had an answer. Right. So I think you, know, you making sure you're asking the, the questions that we, we trust the data and that people, another success story, it was one of the nonprofits and they had only used data. This was an aha moment for me for punitive. Um, and maybe that was the the question that just came in, right? People only used it of, hey, you, you didn't make your 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 numbers this month, and you you need to get up, and it, they just felt like or grades, you know, used for punitive rather than learning, right? Um, so they had to kind of make it a positive. The what if, what could we do to help our students, or what could we do to drive sales, and kind of get that curiosity. So I think that's one reason. Are you literally driving, making decisions for the company, on? data and that's kind of like the dashboard right but there's also the engine of the car to use that analogy and that would be your master data and operational is the data i'm using to run the company go back to product or customers or students and courses is that good enough to be running the engine are you going to be knocking and pinging and things like that because of bad data quality so i think there's a lot more but those are the two key ones are you making decisions based on data and is the data that's literally running the engine of the company good enough to be effective and efficient if that makes sense does indeed. Thank you. And if you have questions for Donna, feel free to put them in the Q&A panel. I'll, I'll try and look too in the chat, but um, we have a lot of folks intimidated or turned off by data. Do we? Do you have any recommendation for how to help non-data folks buy into a data-driven culture? Yes. Um, so I talked about one already as I saw that one come in. Um, uh, what, what's been, gosh, this could be a whole webinar, right? Organizational change management. How has been their experience with data in the past? One I mentioned was it was only used for punitive. You know, think of school. You, you've got a B, not an A, you're a bad person, right? Versus like, hey, let's learn this thing <laughs> and, and and let's get excited about science rather than just, you know, feeling you're going to get punished. So that that would be one. Um, we often get turned on. I'm thinking of one client. Again, I mentioned earlier, we in IT or data, like this whole idea of data literacy, I'm not a fan of because it makes people feel out of the gate that we're illiterate, You're right? No, I'm, I'm a, we had one woman, she was a, a professor of medicine, right? She's like, I have a PhD and an MD. I've literally done brain surgery on people and I won't talk to the IT department. They make me feel stupid and I'm not stupid. I just don't know what a router is or, right? And so I think we do that and almost make it seem 
like it's something separate when data is the business. And I, I almost want to do a whole webinar. I'll talk to Shannon about it. It's not data literacy. Maybe it's business literacy for the IT, for the technical teams, right? So the more you put it in common sense terms that the business is probably already thinking about is, is one. Um, and then maybe just that excitement we, we had worked with. I'm just trying to throw a bunch of things out there that have worked. One was that, again, with school, if you only focus on on, on grades, kids get turned off. But with data, gosh, it's so exciting. What if? And we had kind of like a what if session. What would you love to learn? What might help you grow your business? Wouldn't you love to know what customers prefer about our products? Wouldn't you love to know what, right? And that kind of got people thinking and brainstorming with no risk or no judgment or whatever. And then we kind of worked out backwards. But those are at least three things that don't make it punitive. Don't kind of talk to people, maybe listen to people. And then can you kind of make it fun or let them kind of explore and think? Or, or just don't say no right away or, you know, make it more of a brainstorming session and get them more involved. Um, those are three things, a lot more, but those are three off the top that might help. Helpful, indeed. Um, thank you. So, Donna, can you uh, address the pros and cons of having data scientists leverage raw data versus clean, conformed data? Well, oh, that's a good question. Um, yes. <laughs> I, I, and so I think there's a misconception and I, th I think it's gone past, there was the day of the, you don't need a warehouse, you don't need an ODS, let's just drop raw data into a lake and magic happens. Um, and I think we've seen beyond that, I actually argued with a client, um, you know, saying you, you probably actually, ironically, it was patient um, data. And he said, you know, we, we don't need to clean up our patient data, we'll just do volume. And they were doing like predictive analytics of like, gender right or gender isn't, you know, it was the data scientists that stood up and said, no, we really want master data <laughs> like for that stuff. You know, volume doesn't make it better, right? Um, if, if it's bad data. So I think in some areas you still, you, but with these new platforms, you're going to have the best of both worlds. We also just don't want to throw away data like social media sentiment from patients or students or customers, right? Or, um, you know, in, in some cases, I'm thinking some of the sensor data they wanted the raw sensor data from buses, um, but had to clean up some later, but they didn't want to stop making decisions on it because the sensor went down for a few minutes and they had to kind of address it. So I, I think you you can do a best of both worlds. Just think of why do I need the raw or the volume? I think sometimes you will also want to have the, the, the rules identified. What do we mean by cleaned or conformed? Conformed to one person may not be conformed to the other. So I think that's the the challenge of master data. If I'm saying this is the golden record of a customer, I hope we all agree. This is the address we used. Um, and some, uh, I'll stop rambling on this one, but we work with some government and they had to use the, the source data, even if they had the correct address, um, the person had moved, but the old data, so they had to, or someone had been certified with a, but through their maiden name and now they've been married, they had to keep the old name. So sometimes you need the wrong data to make with, <laughs> so it can be complicated. I think, with data lake houses, you can have the both and just be really clear which is which. And when we clean it and conform it, what are the rules we used? All right, I'll stop rambling about that one. I love it. Well, we have just three minutes left. So I'm going to slip in as many questions as uh, we have time here. So um, the pie chart about treating data as an asset, it's easy to say yes on a survey to this, but how do you verify that they are actually treating data as an asset? I don't, it's a question on the survey. There's my snarky answer, but no, I see the point. Um, we, often I would say, well, I actually thought that was pretty low. So I think it wasn't, I think people did give a thought because it was only 60. It's not like everyone said, yes, I, I actually thought it was fairly low. I mean, how we do it when we're with the client and there's other tools that you could do it yourself, like a, a data management maturity assessment, right? Think of the DEMA DMBOC or the data management body of knowledge. Think of all those dimensions. Yeah, we might be great at dashboards. They're pretty, but the quality isn't, yeah, be, be nuanced. Um, how are we treating it? Is there data management, uh, data governance in place? Um, and so, yeah, I think just like with product quality or anything else, we're treating quality or uh, generally accounted, accounting principles for finance. You know, there's ways to track that. And I think nowadays we have a lot. You know, do we have data quality dashboards and things? So um, I, th I think, yeah, maturity assessment, things like data quality dashboards, things like glossaries to make sure we all agree as an asset. But um, yeah, that's my answer. I love it. Um, so Donna, in your experience, um, how do you quantify data management practices, business value contribution as a back office enabling function? Um, well, I would say 
uh, some of those boxes, I, I kind of those four flavors, decrease cost, increase revenue, risk, and uh, what was the other one? Sentiment, uh, or, you know, uh, positive uh, input. Um, because it's a it's an enabling, but you are actually enabling efficiency. And so, you know, there's ways to do ROI analysis on on some of that. I think there's also, um, yeah, some anecdotes, right? If we don't have a good view of our customer or our product, how are we going to sell things? So, you know, I, I think there's some really good ways to tie it more to business value based on some of those, if that makes sense. Well, Donna, this has been another amazing webinar. Thank you so much. And thanks to our community for being so engaged in everything we do. But I'm afraid that is all the time that we have for this webinar. Uh, just a reminder, again, I will send a follow-up email to all registrants by end of day Monday with links to the slides, links to the recording from this session. Donna, thank you so much. Frank, thank you. Always a pleasure. Have a good day, everyone. Bye-bye.